Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We have two presenters with us. The first one is uh, Kareem S. Kareem. Uh, he has developed novel X-ray imaging devices and systems since 1998. He has supported two startups, Ignis Innovation and UltraScan, and has founded two companies, uh, Active Pixel and KA Imaging in the past two decades. Uh, Kareem has also raised more than $15 million in research grant funding, trained over 40 PhD students and Master of Science students, and has co-authored over 250 publications and holds over 50 patents. Some of the X-ray circuit technology he has developed is now in use in ultrasonic fingerprint sensors and mobile phones and tablets. And then we have Dr. Patrick Rojala, who completed his medical studies as well as his uh, radiology residency at the Free University of Berlin in Germany. After having completed a clinical fellowship in gastrointestinal imaging at the University of California, UCSF in the United States, he returned to Germany. And then in 2009, Dr. Rogello was appointed as full professor of the radiology at the University of Toronto and held a position as the head of the abdominal imaging division from July 2010 until December 2017. In, tw in February 2018, he was appointed as head of the cardiothoracic imaging division and deputy head of innovation at JDMI. Dr. Rogella has published more than 169 original articles, several book chapters, and is currently holding two international patents. He's actively involved in many professional and international radiological societies. And in June, 2020, he graduated from the Rotman School of Business with an MBA in Health and Life Sciences. And today they are presenting on better polymer imaging with dual um, energy X-ray technology. Dr. Rogella. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and thank you for the kind introduction and welcome everyone. Um, this is an exciting topic because uh, not frequently will we have the chance to introduce new technology, breakthrough technology that will help us uh, improve care for the patients who need it. Next slide, please. Um, you know, today what we're trying to do is we will look at pulmonary disease and the role of X-ray in the detection and management of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I think the audience should at the end understand what dual energy actually is and how it's being done in particular when we look at a single exposure dual energy X-ray. There are multiple ways of skinning a cat, there's multiple ways of obtaining an image, but the signal exposure dual energy technique is the one we're talking about today. And certainly um, I would like to uh, make sure that everybody understands the current hospital implementation, what we're doing, what we're testing, and then what we believe this technology will bring in the future for patients, individuals with um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Next. Um, the landscape is full of challenges when it comes to the lung. And you, you probably know lung cancer is the number one cancer that kills people, despite the fact that we have now phenomenal uh, therapies, including inhibitor check, uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors that have made lung cancer almost a chronic disease. There's pneumonia. Pneumonia is a huge killer today. It's a huge issue. I'm not specifically speaking about COVID, but COVID is just one expression of how vulnerable we are when it comes to pneumonia and how little we can do and understand often how to treat those diseases. And pneumothorax sounds rare, but in fact, it's quite frequently happening. And if it happens and remains undetected and we don't find the right therapy immediately, it might be a deadly disease. Tuberculosis People think it's not a disease of the Western world anymore. That's not actually true. We have a number of tuberculosis cases and the number is rising. And then there's the pulmonary fibrosis, big bucket. It's a disease that needs to be detected early. There are some 
promising therapies out there, but the key to success is knowing which type and seeing it early enough to initiate treatment. Next slide. The pathway is complex, and I'm pretty sure many patients, many individuals will not be able to understand the complexity of that uh, pathway and the algorithms we follow. I can assure you it's not entirely necessary that everybody understands every detail. But what I would like to highlight here is we have guidelines of many societies. There was a, um, there's an agreement of all international societies that have a say in this domain. And essentially what it is, is as soon as there is suspicion of an idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we need to look clinically if there is a reason why is the patient suspected of having it? And maybe we can find a reason that makes it very likely. The first test quite frequently then is an x-ray, but let's skip this for now. What people do then is a CT scan. And if a specific diagnosis can be seen, not in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, then we have a diagnosis and then we know what we can do. And there's a whole myriad of different treatment options out there. The challenge comes when there's no specific diagnosis. And then we need to make sure the diagnosis we make follows a certain pattern on CT. And the usual interstitial pneumonia and the abbreviation is UIP is the one which is so challenging to rule out. As soon as we have for instance, exposure, we have a pre-existing connectivity tissue disease, or we have hypersensitivity pneumonitis pattern, which is related to exposures or pneumoconiosis, well, then we can make a diagnosis. But if we rule this out and there's nothing else available, but we still have the pattern on CT, then the IPF is the likeliest diagnosis. And you might see that actually imaging is the first step before pathology. And quite frequently in those uh, conferences which we, which we participate in, the CT is the gold standard. It's the truth before pathology comes uh, as a second step. So that is established. That's being done in all hospitals. But the biggest question is how do we cast the broader net and get people, individuals who have symptoms that may mimic or are representative of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, how do we get them into the clinic? How do we establish initially the diagnosis? Not everyone can get right away a CT scan for many reasons. Um, one of the biggest reasons is simply capacity. It is certainly cost. You can think about radiation exposure, not maybe the primary concern if you are sick, but the whole system is not set up as such, and it may be a waste of time, energy, and resources. So chest x-ray is frequently the first initial test. Next slide, please. And it is important on that initial test that we establish the suspicion. We may not be as specific, and you will see that in a second, but the important piece here is to establish the suspicion and justify further investigation. What we don't want to have is that we overlook, we miss a critical diagnosis, which then puts the patient at risk further down the road. And with that, I would like to hand over to Karim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rogala. So let me give you a little bit of a background on dual energy X-ray subtraction. So dual energy X-ray subtraction, the technique at least, was discovered or, or, or designed maybe about 40 or 50 years ago, uh, 19, in the 1970s. The idea is actually very simple. What you're doing is you're using X-ray physics to create an X-ray image where the bone and the soft tissue can be separated. So for example, on the right-hand side here, you've got a low energy X-ray image, you've got a high energy X-ray image, and then a subtraction is done that allows you to isolate only the soft tissue and in this case, only the bone. The trick is in the physics, which is we're actually looking for certain materials. In this case, the materials are tuned for calcium and water. So calcium gives you bone and any calcification that goes along with it. 
the water basically gives you the lung and all the other soft tissue. It's a very powerful technique. It's been around for a while. It's been shown in many different um, clinical use cases that it improves patient outcomes. For example, for pneumonia, for lung nodules, for um, emphysema, for um, coronary calcium, for tuberculosis even. And the idea is that it enables early disease detection, which can shorten the time to getting a corrective procedure. At the same time, it uses considerably less radiation compared to a CT. It's akin to an X-ray because you get your X-ray with the dual energy images. You also get the dual energy images, which help you improve your accuracy. And therefore, you get a reduction in diagnostic error as well as malpractice. There's also been research that shows that you can get higher operating efficiencies, meaning people who read dual energy images, even though there's more images to read, tend to do so faster than single images, primarily because the dual energy data makes the X-ray easier to read. And this also allows a variety of clinicians, radiologists, internists, residents to make accurate diagnoses. And then lastly, it's significantly less expensive than a CT. So the big question, of course, is why is dual energy not widely used? And that all comes down to technology. So the previous technology implementations, and there's quite a few, um, have had some issues. The biggest one is they require more radiation than a regular X-ray. So they're not a perfect substitute for X-ray. They it's something above and beyond. Um, older implementations also have had a hard time um, giving all the views that somebody might want. For example, PA and AP refers to frontal views, but they haven't been able to give you the lateral or the side view. The equipment that they've been installed in have been typically expensive systems and they're proprietary, only one or two vendors on the market supply it. So that acts as a barrier. The solution is also not mobile and that limits um, its, its, its adoptability um, in hospitals. And then the last piece, which is also one of the more serious criticisms of these um, implementations is that the images are defective. Um, they suffer from something called a motion artifact. And that is a consequence of the fact that these devices require two X-ray exposures to function. And because of those two exposures, if you have any kind of breathing motion or cardiac motion, um, you're going to end up getting a misregistration, which causes this white streak that you see in the image right there. And, and anecdotally, we've heard that the images become unusable about one fifth of the time. So that's the reason why this technology never really took off. Now, what we did with our single exposure solution is we kind of overcame all of the previous um, challenges. We did this by developing a multi-layer sensor technology at Waterloo that allows us to capture three different images in a single exposure. And the fact that we can get these three images in a single exposure, first of all, eliminates the motion artifact. But at the same time, the three images allow you to get really, really good dose efficiency. So in fact, our device gives you the same, um, it, it, it uses the same amount of radiation as a regular chest X-ray. But at the same time, you also get the dual energy images. In a sense, it's clinically free. So the idea is that a hospital or clinical system could attach one of these detectors to their existing X-ray rooms or mobile X-rays. All of these rooms and X-rays already come with the detector. This would be a substitute for that detector. And this device would be used in exactly the same way and it would give you a standard X-ray, the bone X-ray and the soft tissue X-ray in a single exposure at a regular um, clinical technique for chest X-ray. So the advantage is that you would get higher accuracy getting close to a CT. It's not as good as a CT, but it does have some advantages like accessibility because it's portable and it can go into places that CT cannot and it's affordable. 
there's a few of these solutions, like I said, that have been out, uh, out there for a while. You've got the single exposure that we've been working on. You've got some software that mimics that type of situation. You've got dual exposure, the older generation dual energy, and then you've got the regular chest X-ray, which is currently the gold standard when it comes to X-ray. The idea, of course, is with single exposure dual energy, you'd be able to do more, uh, you'd be able to resolve more clinical cases than chest X-ray because it opens up the um, possibilities. It, it's got the same accessibility as an X-ray, but it gives you so much more in terms of image and, and visualization but it uses the same amount of radiation as a regular X-ray. It can be used using all the similar clinical techniques, for example, grids or no grids. It has better sensitivity. In fact, um, it can also uh, allow you to reduce your radiation dose um, compared to a regular X-ray. And um, you get the separation that comes with dual energy, separating calcium and soft tissue, which allows you to visualize um, bone and soft tissue separately. You can use it in pretty much any view, AP, PA, the frontal, the lateral, the obliques. And this allows it, of course, the flexibility of being used in multiple scenarios. It's portable and mobile. So it could be used in a, in a mobile situation, like an ER room where you have a mobile X-ray. And of course, there's no motion artifacts. And just to kind of emphasize the part about motion artifacts, these are some of the existing solutions in the market um, and this is all publicly available data and then this is of course the single exposure solution and in each of the existing or the pre-existing solutions the motion artifact is quite visible and in this case it's kind of harmless but in many cases it's not um, and that's where of course the image quality becomes quite important so at this point i'll hand it back to dr rogala to continue. Thank you very much. And Karima always have to say, um, we communicate frequently. It's always amazing how you make complex physics so simple to understand for everyone, uh, for clinicians, for patients, for everyone uh, who is using this technique. So let me continue with a clinical use case. And um, in full disclosure, we didn't start with the most complex question for a reason. First of all, the technology came out practically being Health Canada approved during COVID. And what our primary interest at that point was to ensure that we have the capacity to detect early COVID cases, which essentially is pneumonia cases, to ensure that those individuals, those patients, get the appropriate treatment right away, or if there's no treatment required, can self-isolate. Um, Pneumonia can have a pattern that is very similar to interstitial lung disease. That's absolutely possible. So we're not far away from the patterns we're looking for. And what is in common between pulmonary fibrosis and also some viral infections is the fact that can be very subtle. They can be very challenging to detect on, on X-ray. Um, you can imagine starting a clinical trial during COVID has its own specific challenges not only for recruitment, disinfection, physical distancing, uh, concerns of people uh, when they come into um, hospitals, uh, ventilation, um, airborne situations where you get close to, uh, to staff, et cetera. I don't have to expand on this any further, but you can imagine we were um, faced with a lot of uh, difficulties with setting up this trial, but we still did it. And the reason why we did it is because we were confident in believing at this point, based on the physics, that given the increased demand for imaging during COVID, we need a technology that is able to detect changes early enough, maybe not with the highest precision, but early enough so that we understand which person needs to go to further testing and which person can potentially wait. Next. Um, the pulmonary disease case study here in pneumonia is a great publication if you would like to check it out, looks at the um, economics <clears throat> of diseases in the chest. And it's interesting that pneumonia is, is, is pretty dominant and causes a lot of, of challenges to the healthcare system. 
not only for inpatients, because it's the fifth most principal diagnosis in people who are in the hospital, but also the annual cost is in the range of $62,000. When we compare this to cost of um, checkpoint inhibitors, for instance, the new drug line that treats cancer, it is actually not much. But remember, those are individuals which may or may not be sick otherwise. Pneumonias can come and go, and they can be treated, and people leave the hospital. So the cost factor is actually quite um, significant. And also, the mortality is not subtle. It's 5 to 7% of all admitted patients. Um, that, that is a significant factor. Um, I just don't know if you are interested, but there's a, a challenge also who pays for the study, who, who, who is providing the funding, if it's new, if we have to go to further advanced tests. Um, many people believe in the US, there is a lot of uh, private pay in the system. In fact, there is, but in Canada, I don't know if anyone is interested in it. We have a single payer model and in Canada, patients pay more private contributions to the healthcare system than actually in the US. So it is a significant issue. And what I'm trying to express here is that pneumonia should not be overlooked as a key uh, disease that we need to detect early enough. But how does it relate to uh, pulmonary fibrosis in two ways? A, many of those patterns are very similar. The distribution can be similar, the symptoms can be similar, but also in pneumonia can occur in people and you as potentially um, patients or individuals who know someone who is affected by pulmonary fibrosis might know that pneumonia can be challenging in this patient population because there is less resistance to infections and those individuals have to be very careful when they expose themselves to an infectious environment. Next. Um, the initial study, and as Kareem told you here, uh, that was done with dual exposure um, extra. This study actually comes uh, out of Zurich. And what the investigators have done is they have looked at the gained sensitivity. How well does the new technique, which in this particular situation is dual exposure, dual energy, how much does it increase the detection rate of lung emphysema, scarring, and reticular changes? Reticular lung changes means it's a network. It's you seeing the structure of the lung, which is essentially the hallmark of uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But also we want to be specific. Specific means if we diagnose the disease in almost every second patient and it turns out to be wrong, we're not really helping the individual and we specifically don't help the healthcare system either. So what you can see here is how much higher sensitivity and specificity has become by utilizing, by utilizing dual energy. And again, let me repeat, this is the older technology. This is not single exposure technology, but it shows it has an impact. Next slide, please. What I wanted to, to do today is to show you and share with you the initial results of the trial we have been doing here at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Now, why do we chose Cancer Center? Not because we're looking for cancers, is because there is a disease group, there's a patient population which is immunocompromised for many reasons, bone marrow transplant patients, other patients who have cancers in their blood that are very much receptive to pneumonia. So we wanted to make sure we have enough uh, people who have a positive finding so that we can draw meaningful conclusions. That's the only reason why we set up the trial at a cancer center. Next slide, please. And the purpose of our study was to evaluate whether the diagnostic value is, is real as a novel portable multilayer detector comes into clinics. And really, do we, do we improve our ability to detect diseases, find diseases, reticular diseases in the chest? And if so, are we correct? Do we make false diagnoses? What's the error rate? And that was the whole purpose of this trial to ensure we're not importing new technology while at the same time we have a minor impact and may potentially add additional cost. Next. Um, I would not like to go too far into details of the, um, of the study design, but I chose just three main bullets that you might be interested. Of course, everything that's being done in a hospital uh, needs to have ethics board approval, and that's a given and we always do it, which means 
there is a large body overlooking the study design, making sure it's appropriately con uh, done, conducted, and we also follow all national and international guidelines. And as I mentioned earlier, we took a patient population that is specifically receptive, receptive to pneumonia and changes, which are patients with leukemia and patients post uh, stem cell transplant. And we also made sure that those people come, those patients come with a suspicion of pneumonia. Because the last thing we wanted is having hundreds of patients that have normal lungs, and then we can't really uh, draw any meaningful uh, conclusions. And what we also did is, and that's a key element of any study design, you need proof. You can diagnose whatever you want in any new technology. But the question then always is, is this the right one? Um, did we make any error? And to, to make sure this is the case and to understand what the truth is, we underwent, patients underwent also a CT scan, which was clinically meaningful and clinically indicated. And the benefit of such a design is that not only do we have the novel technology on many patients, but we also have proof, the gold standard, or I should say the reference standard, which I explained earlier to you is currently HRCT and HR stands for high resolution CT. That's not anything specific anymore. High resolution CT is done worldwide as the reference method, but what it means is very thin slices down to 0.5 millimeters. And as you probably can understand, that provides high morphological detail and will allow us to make the determination whether a patient actually is suffering from fibrosis or not. So we have a patient population now that has undergone the new technique, dual energy single exposure technique. And we do have for the same individual within a very short period of time, we're talking about a few minutes up to maybe an hour, we have a comparison ground truth CT that allows us to define whether the x-ray showed the truth or did not show the truth. And then those images, once we have them, were evaluated by at least two the skilled radiologists. The radiologists in our department are specialized to look at x-rays and CT because we want to make sure we have true experts in the field giving us a diagnosis. Next. Next slide. And as you can see on that uh, list here, those two radiologists were blinded to the standard of care and that's abbreviated as SOC, standard of care technology, which is the CT. And we wanted to make sure that we don't bias the readers. If you show people the truth before you look at new technology, well, what else would they say? Individuals are easy to be biased, they're easy to be influenced, and then, and then you wouldn't get the truth. So we, the, we specifically made sure that people who look at the novel technique have no clue what the truth actually is. And then there's a bit of a specific how you design studies. Not only you're asking what is the diagnosis, you're only asking, um, you're also asking for alternative diagnoses and also how confident individuals are. And that's a key element in the study because it could well be that new technologies don't really show new diseases, but it makes it more easy. It makes it, it allows a reader, a radiologist to make a more confident diagnosis, to say for sure this is what it is, rather than suspecting a disease. And to do so, that's why we used a scale of one to 10, where we then say the higher the number, the more confident the reader is that he or she makes the right diagnosis. And um, then once that was being done, then we also evaluated the image quality because you know it could well be that the regular x-ray is good, but not as good as the conventional technique. And then we would potentially run into problems in the future. Next slide. Um, the standard of care images and the report were then reviewed by a third fellowship trained radiologist. And that was done specific to make sure that any discrepancy from the first and the second reader or between two radiologists or a clinical report will be resolved because no one is error free. It could well be that um, the clinical report is wrong, 
it could well be one reader makes a mistake and the other one finds it. So we needed sort of a judge in the end to establish the ground truth. And that's what we did. And this was very helpful to make a third analysis. And that is how well do these readers agree? It could be possible, and it's not uncommon to see in clinical practice, you have two people looking at the same image, same image, and then they come to a different conclusion. That is interesting to know, but maybe not helpful because then what you need to do, you need to do another test to ensure that either of which actually was right or wrong, and that is another burden to the healthcare system. Next. So I can report on the first 33 patients that we enrolled, and the age is just a technical factor here, which is typically the age that we see in our cancer center here. We had a little bit of a dominance of male patients, but that is just technical. It happens to happen that way. It will be different as soon as we have enrolled more patients. And as I mentioned before, we were specifically looking for infectious opacities, and opacity is a general term that means a shadow, people understand the same thing, a shadow, or um, uh, structures that would simulate interstitial lung disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and viral pneumonia clearly does the same, uh, the same to the lung. Next slide. Um, the image quality was rated very high. You can see it, the scale went from one to five. Now you could argue is 3.7 and 3.4 really the best you could potentially get? No. And we'll have time at the end when you can ask questions, specifically, can this technology be widely deployed for all conditions? Here is already an answer. We still need further improvements of the technique to make sure really it provides the best possible quality uh, we can achieve. But I have to let you know, even the conventional X-ray is not a five. In fact, it's in the same range, maybe even a little bit lower. And it has to, with the physics of an X-ray, it's not the perfect technique. Kareem has told you there can be motion in it. Um, patients may not be able to hold their breath. There's a number of reasons why X-rays are not perfect. And then we looked at the um, agreement between those readers. And it's interesting to see when you can read here, chest X-ray, CR, had only a moderate agreement. Isn't that disturbing? You have two world leading experts looking at an X-ray and they're actually not agreeing in a number of cases. How is that possible? And the reason is very simple. X-ray has a number of challenges. It's a superimposition picture. Not only experience comes into play, but also sometimes intuition or sometimes an idea. And then people say, I believe it's something different, but they're not sure. So the disagreement in X-ray is a known fact. It's not new. And the value that I showed to you here, 0.57, is actually quite good, but it shows where the challenges with X-rays lie. And then in bold, you can see chest X-ray plus dual energy, which is the conventional X-ray, which we get anyways in the single exposure DE, plus the separated two new images. And then suddenly the agreement was much better. And what does this tell you? It tells you that additional images had the following effect. It made the readers more confident and not infrequently, it made them change their mind. And that's the benefit of, of any new technology. If it helps to come to a common uh, conclusion that hopefully is the right one, then you really have new technology that helps patients. Next. It is a little bit technical and I'm worried some might not understand what an ROC curve means. That's not the purpose of this presentation. Skip it if you don't uh, want to listen to, to that component. Essentially, it's an receiver operating curve, ROC. And what it says is you can shift sensitivity and specificity to any point you want if you increase the detection rate, you might be more frequently wrong. And if you decrease your detection rate, you're more often right. This is a very common analysis we do in medicine. And comparing two areas under the curve is not trivial, statistically speaking. So don't overinterpret this from the statistics point of view. But what you can interpret is look at this population, the chest X-ray sensitivity, which is 
the detection rate, practically speaking. The specificity is how good are we in establishing the correct diagnosis, and the combination of both is the accuracy. And whichever parameter you take, as soon as dual energy images were unblinded, in addition to the conventional X-ray, all values went up. The area under the curve, the difference was not statistically significant, but as I explained to you, this is a complex thing. We shouldn't focus too much on it. I'm pretty confident it will become uh, significant as soon as we have more patients. We're still only having um, total, as we speak today, around 70 patients, but this need will change in the future and then the value will become um, uh, statistically significant. The bottom line here is, for the same investment, same single exposure, same x-ray, no difference. The only change is the cassette. We take the conventional one out, put the new one in, everything else stays the same. You increase and boost the detection rate of changes in the lung. That's the bottom line of this um, uh, slide. And what really is important, that some readers changed their mind. They looked at the dual energy X-ray and actually flipped the diagnosis. Well, it is only two cases out of 33, and you think that's not really much. Well, for those individuals, it makes a huge difference. Um, and that's why we believe there is a great future in dual energy single exposure technology. Next slide, please. I will show you a few examples. And if you have experience, that's great. If you don't, don't worry. I will just superficially go over the images and show you. And if you as a non-expert can see the difference, well, that is uh, a testimony to the facts that the technology really shows more pathology. So this is the patient with febrile neutropenia. And there is this, the error shows at a tiny opacity. Well, not well seen on the X-ray for many reasons, because, well, there is also um, a catheter overlying. And when we get rid of all this, we just have a picture which is in the middle with the orange arrow that shows the lung tissue plus all other soft tissues. Well, you can see the opacity, not 100% with confidence. And that's okay. It probably will never happen on X-ray. But confident enough to make this, the diagnosis, there is something wrong. And then the person, the patient went further on uh, to having a CT image, and you see on the right side the CT scan, or you see the little infiltrate, the little shadow, which was then pneumonia. This particular example highlights what this technology can do, a diagnosis that was clearly overlooked for no other reason than just visibility by the radiologist. We can't blame anyone. By applying dual energy, the finding was detected. Next. This is an interesting uh, uh, case as well, because fungal pneumonia, I haven't specifically alluded to this, is critical in those patient populations. In fact, um, a fungus is, is a growing concern. Um, we have a lot of uh, antibiotics for, for conventional bacterial infections. We have more antiviral drugs. But for fungal, uh, we are seeing more and more resistances, and, and, and that's concerning. And here is a great example as well. Look how well the, the catheter has been suppressed, but then we see much better. They stand out, these infiltrates, and they're all pneumonia uh, caused by, by fungus. How do I know? Well, there's a very specific CT image as the patient went on to having a CT, and those findings are classic for pneumonia infection. But the picture itself, the, the tiny ground glass, as we call it, these whitish areas, this is a finding we also find in uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So we are confident in saying that detecting better pneumonia will help us improve detecting fibrosis as well. Next slide. Um, these, what we call consolidations, are areas in which the air is gone and replaced by soft tissue. It could be infection, it could be edema, it could be fluid, it could be bacteria, whatever the cause is. And you see them as opacities, as consolidation. The air actually is gone. And without going into further details, I think even a person who is not skilled in reading x-rays can see the significant difference, how much more these opacities stand out. They're marked with the orange arrows on the right image, they stand out against the rest if compared to the conventional X-ray 
that was done portably. And that means the, the person is not coming to radiology. We are coming with the cassette to the patient who was in the intensive care unit. Next. This is also something which is um, more a technical uh, subtlety, but very important. Uh, individuals who have disease such as pneumonia or even idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and need some treatment, they might actually get a catheter to deliver some medications. And detecting where the catheter is positioned in the correct position, where it ends, where it's located is critical. Uh, we do have, it's not frequent, but we do have cases in which the catheter just went the wrong way and we need to detect it. And as you can see with very little skills, the end of the, detect, uh, of the catheter is much better detected once we have the uh, subtracted bone image. And which is why we believe that in that specific scenario, when this is in question, dual energy signal exposure is uh, improving our detection rate. Next. And this is in particular true when we look at the lateral view. Lateral view means the person is standing sideways against the x-ray. Why is that so important? Because it allows you to show whether the catheter is more in the front or in the back. And there are some vessels which look like as if the catheter is in this correct position, but in fact it isn't. And the lateral view is critically important to make that distinction. And as you can see, without any skills, so much better seen on the bone image than on any other image. And it's subtracted in the soft tissue. Why is that the case? Well, because the catheter is not soft tissue. So it doesn't show up on that image, which you see on the right side. Again, same conclusion. This technology helps us detect foreign bodies and specifically catheters. Next slide will show you another catheter that might be uh, introduced in patients who have pneumothorax. We talked about this or any other condition to drain fluid, et cetera. And it's very important to know where the catheter is located. Sure, we can do a CT and then we will know definitively, but it would be nice in the portable situation where the person cannot come to a CT unit to make the same diagnosis with much less effort and hopefully with the same confidence as on a CT scan, which here is the case on this example. Next, please. Um, this individual now gets very close to finding that you can find in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There's architectural distortion, there's a network overlying the lungs, which we find in those diseases. And the extent of the disease is much better appreciated on the soft tissue image. Something I wanted to um, highlight here is as soon as you see how much better disease is visualized, we as radiologists, as diagnosticians, we need to learn as well. We cannot take just a new technology and say, oh, it's more, so the disease has to be progressed. We need to learn. We need to understand how much better this technique shows certain conditions, and then make sure we're not overcalling the finding. But I think this case is very illustrative of the fact that disease is much better depicted on the soft tissue when it comes to subtleties in the lung. Next. Um, this one. And now I will show you two cases that I find most interesting. And the reason is because you may find it easy on the very left side here to see the equivalent of the opacity of this shadow that is shown in the middle. But I can tell you for sure, quick view, maybe a little bit worse of the quality, maybe the person was moving slightly, conditions are not great. It is very simple to miss this finding. Honestly, it shouldn't be happening. And um, we make sure we have double reads, we, we control our quality over time, but you can't blame anyone if at night, two o'clock at night, a quick view, you have to express your, your opinion if that finding is not seen. But look how nice it's being visualized on the soft tissue image. And as I said before, on the bone image, of course, it's not visualized that the whole purpose of having bones only. So in this particular circumstance, um, a good radiologist, and most of them are good, some are experts, will probably not miss this finding. But after bones have been subtracted, it is so crystal clear that there is an opacity which requires further investigation. I don't think anyone will ever miss this finding. 
and the next one is also something that uh, has even historical meaning. Um, before the CT technology evolved in the way that it really has a continuous acquisition uh, over the entire chest without any gaps, a helical scan, it was quite frequent that we missed this finding on CT2. And why is that the case? Because the joint of the first rib to the sternum can be more calcified. It typically is bilaterally the case, but it can be unilateral, more in women than in men. And then if you don't know if this is caused by bone or you just dismiss it because you believe it's caused by bone, you might overlook a true finding. In fact, historically, the next step uh, 30, 40 years ago was to do conventional tomography. I don't know if anyone who is in the audience has ever had such a study, um, possibly not, but it was commonly used before the advent of, of CT and CT took that over. But this is the most classic false positive and false negative on X-ray. In fact, it was in CT as well initially. But look how well it's being visualized. Well, as soon as you subtract calcium, when you do that, um, well, what remains is soft tissue. And soft tissue is exactly what we are looking for. It isn't true opacity. It was over, over superimposed onto bones. And for that reason, we don't know if it's a true finding or a false positive. And the bone image will then show you, there's an additional uh, calcification, but actually the finding is true on the middle X-ray. And uh, just as a highlight, you also can see calcifications in the coronary arteries. I'm not in the position now to make sure this is a replacement for the coronary artery tests we perform, but it's an interesting side finding and I'm pretty sure it will be looked at in the future in uh, studies that are to come. Next slide. I will uh, conclude from what I have shown to you. And the key message here is there is no penalty. Um, if anyone is, um, is interested in, in, a, in a business analogy, um, the return of investment, so to speak, is higher. You invest the same amount of radiation, you invest the same amount of time, you're practically doing the same thing. You're using the existing X-ray technology, but you just replace the detector. And what you get, technically for free, for free, you get images that we were unable to get before. And those additional images improve the diagnostic confidence. Let me make this as the key message. It improves the diagnostic confidence. It may show, and we have seen those cases, additional findings. I wouldn't be in the position now to say that's the general rule. We hope that will be the case as well, but it improves the diagnostic accuracy and the confidence. And that is the key message here. Um, the inter-observer agreement that has improved is just another way of expressing the same thing. If you have two readers and they suddenly agree and are better, you have eliminated variability. And as you probably know, variability, whether caused by technical factors or variability caused by something we don't know, is one of the biggest risks in medicine. And we try in the future to do everything to ensure that we eliminate variability and come down to the best possible diagnosis for the patients. Next, um, in summary, uh, and I'm handing it over to Kareem, I wanted to also thank my coworkers. It is a uh, common practice and I mean it uh, specifically for this study. I would like to thank Kareem for, uh, and KA Imaging specifically, for allowing us to test the device. Uh, that does happen, does not happen very often that we get um, such a promising technology um, technically as, uh, as a, in a scenario where we can test it. Um, support was great. I also want to thank uh, my technologist, uh, Mary May, who uh, was invaluable in uh, making sure we have the right setup and supported the whole study from the beginning and it's still ongoing. And lastly, my clinical fellow who helped me analyzing the data, Felipe Sanchez, uh, who was a clinical fellow last year, and without him, it wouldn't have been possible to put the data together. And with that, I thank you for your attention and hand over to Kareem to make the final closing remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ogala. I, I also want to echo your sentiments. Uh, 
thank you to you and the UHN team. I just want to add that uh, new technology is nice, but you also need uh, innovative clinicians and it's hard to find innovative clinicians. So thank you for that. And thank you to the whole UHN team for putting up with uh, the new technology and all the hurdles that come with trying to get it off the ground. And of course, thank you to the KA Imaging team for working so diligently um, and to PF for, uh, for giving us this opportunity to present, plus obviously UHN, um, University of Waterloo um, and uh, uh, Grand Challenges Canada and all our funders who've got us to this point. Um, thank you both, uh, Dr. Rogala and Karim. Uh, the Canadian Polymer for Fibrosis Foundation is ex very pleased to have both of you present this today. And now we're open the Q&A and we have uh, several questions. So the first question is that someone says that they work with dual energy gamma radiation for non-medical studies. Uh, what are the two energy levels used for the X-ray? And what is the response of the lung scarring at the two energy levels? Um, Karine, I think for the technical aspect, why don't you start answering that component? By all means. Um, sorry, I just had a little bit of a technical glitch on my battery, but I should be fine now. So with regards to the dual energy, traditionally dual energy has used two energies. Um, in this particular single exposure, we make use of the fact that the X-ray spectrum that comes out of a standard hospital tube is polychromatic. And what I mean by that is it contains a range of energies all the way from the low up to the maximum. So when you hear a 120 kilovolts spectrum, you're actually referring to all the energies from zero to 120. Um, so in our case, our detector, it, it functions on how these energies absorb in the different layers. The lower energies traditionally will absorb in earlier on in the top layers and the higher energies will penetrate more to the bottom layers. So that's basically how we do the spectral separation. We have a three layer stack of sensors that separates the energy based on depth of absorption depending on the energy. So that's how we use one exposure, but we actually get three spectrally different images out of it. It's very different from older technology where they actually use two separate exposures to try and create the two spectrally different images. Karim and I might, uh, might chime, in, chime in here. Um, that's pretty much the same uh, dif um, you know, distinction and difference in, in CT imaging. There's the same technique. You can use two different energies to begin with, and either you switch the tube or you have two tubes or whatever you do, um, and then you get the same detector that detects different uh, energies. Or in the alternative, use one tube, which has the polychromatic image uh, output, and then you have a detector that separates the response. And the beauty of detector side response analysis is it's 100% synchronous. There's no time difference. That makes the technique so attractive. Uh, thank you. This person also wanted to know that you only re referenced IPF and not PF. And so um, he was wondering, you know, was there a difference in the observation between IPF and PF? Because as most people know, IPF, the only difference between that is that you don't know how you contracted pulmonary fibrosis, whereas PF means that you do know. Yes, that is correct. I tried to allude to this on the slide, which shows the, uh, the flow chart of how the diagnosis is currently established. Pulmonary fibrosis is a description of what happens in the lung. It, it, it turns into a scar, essentially. And uh, if you... Um, if, if you know the, the cause, um, well, then you have already the first step that you can do, right? Let's assume it's exposure. You have birds at home or you have anything else that you inhale, you get a reaction in the lung. It's an allergic reaction and can lead to fibrosis. Well, the best therapy is not doing any medication, remove the birds as sad as it might be for the individual. Uh, it could be mold in the home. It could be many other exposures. So. What I'm trying to your question, what I'm trying to say is, yes, I understand. We, we know this very well. This is what we all do by getting clinical information. Actually, you might not know, but we sometimes really send people 
um, staff and, and, and medical staff to the homes of patients to find out if there's any exposure because there's no other way of finding out, of course, with consent and if the patient asked for it. So the answer to that question is absolutely. Fibrosis is the biggest topic. Pulmonary fibrosis means in the lung. That's what we're trying to detect. And whether it's idiopathic or a response to anything else we find out is a medical question. But detecting the condition, that's what we're talking about. Okay. And someone also wanted to know, is there a publication on this topic? Because they're very interested as a PF patient and also as an engineer. I just uh, put in the chat a link to a website that contains a whole list of publications. Okay. If you don't mind sending me that as well, Karim, then, then I can share it with the rest of the community as well. Okay. Uh, someone on the chat room wanted to ask, there was a blind test showed an improvement of 6%. Could you elaborate more on the significance of the 6%? It seems to be marginal from a base of 65%. Yes and no. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a very good question and very good observation. I thank the individual for, for asking, asking this question. Um, yes, it might not look much. Well, first of all, um, if you are belonging to the 6% in which the diagnosis was improved or made better, you would be very happy, right? Uh, number two is, and I should have maybe mentioned this earlier, keep in mind, we are looking at an expert panel here. We're looking at people who have done 30 years of x-ray. They are very good in using x-ray, conventional x-ray to make a diagnosis. And then if that level is already so high, you know, of course, new technology has not the same chance to improve as if you would go with this technique to the community where maybe potentially expertise is not as well established. So that's number one. Number two, whether something is significant or not is not so much the number. It is, does it hold true in a larger population? So let's assume it's 6%, but you have tested 1,000 patients. I can guarantee you it's going to be significantly better. If you only have 10 patients, well, that could have happened by chance. So point is well taken, 6% doesn't sound much, but I wanted to make sure that you understand when new technology comes out, the same in the pharmaceutical industry, the first trials show a breakthrough. Then you put it into the first clinical test, you know, some exceptions apply. You bring it out to the vast majority of people and results are different. Now, what I'm trying to say here is, this is the closest test we come to reality. And that is no surprise to me that the initial, uh, let's say 20, 30% improvement melts down to 6%, but I would not downplay 6% improvement in diagnostic accuracy. Yeah, okay. and, and if I may chime in, even in that study on 33 patients, chest X-ray um, found pneumonia in six patients. Dual energy changed the direction for the positive for two additional patients. So relative to chest X-ray, there was a 25% improvement in finding cases with the pneumonia. Yeah. So the sensitivity numbers, yeah, like they don't directly translate into how many patients um, you're actually going to find. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have someone else who wanted to ask, uh, they thought the best way to detect IPF was CT. Uh, accuracy of this technology versus uh, your technology. Yes, good question. Uh, thank you for, for asking the question. I hope I was clear, the reference standard, I don't like the word gold standard, it's not really gold, but the reference standard, <laughs> standard of care, so to speak, is CT. And CT is not flawless. Of course, it has mistakes and we make mistakes every day, but it's the best current available test to establish the diagnosis. That's the wording we should be using. X-ray will never be as good as X, as CT, for just a technical reason, X-ray is superimposition, CT is cutting the body into thin slices. But it is important to understand we are not competing with CT. We're not trying to replace CT. CT will have its role and will continue to improve. What we're trying to do is to cast a broader net, to catch people who have the suspicion, to bring them in, and if the suspicion is strong enough, to do further tests, which will include laboratory tests, it will include medical assessment, and it will include eventually 
a high resolution CT. Okay, Dr. Rogella, someone wanted to know um, how can they get involved in future studies because they have IPF? Excellent question. And if I had a perfect answer, um, that's a very, very good question. And uh, in fact, it's ironic that we quite frequently struggle recruiting people because we don't know who they are. And if they don't know that we have technology, how would the patients are? There's actually some, some companies who try to match like, an, like an, um, you know, a matching website that helps matching uh, individuals who are interested and uh, studies that are open for recruitment. Um, in this particular situation, we haven't published the uh, recruitment yet. We don't have an uh, a PF study yet, but I'm confident in saying that we will probably open such a study, in which case I will let you know, uh, Sharon, and then maybe through your organization, there will be a way of recruiting individuals yes. who are interested. Yes, I just want to let you know, Dr. Regala, that uh, the Canadian Polymer Fibrosis Foundation we often will post them through our newsletter and our Facebook uh, for those clinicians who are looking for volunteers to participate in studies, in clinical studies. So we're always happy to share that information, okay? Um, the other thing someone wanted to ask was, how does this new technology help people already diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, because they wanna know how does it help with speeding up treatment or you know, new treatment? Yes, that's a very good question as well. Um, I, would, I would respond as follows. Establishing the diagnosis, the firm establishment of the diagnosis is the role of CT and everything else. Um, quite frequently, um, we need to exclude exacerbation or we need to exclude pneumonia because People with this diagnosis can be sick. And then what are we going to do? Is that a flare of the disease or is it a pneumonia? And, or is it normal and something else not related to the lungs? So in that specific question, I believe the X-ray is probably the best technique we have because what you don't want to do is you don't want everyone who comes through eMERGE or whatever channel then say, okay, the reflexes automatically get a full CT. That would be not wise. It would be a not appropriate uh, use of resources in our system. And um, that's the reason why I believe X-ray will play a major role.